And we're live. There we go. Uh, usually there's a countdown banner uh, for us, so I'm not sure how long we we're staring at the camera. Maybe uh, maybe a few seconds, but there was no outtakes. So uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We've got um, an exciting session for, I'd say, folks that are inside the industry or, or, or looking to practice full time. Uh, best practices uh, within crypto. So if you kind of look back at what we did with the annual report and then the session with Bology, for those that were able to tune in last week, the crypto thesis is kind of like the what uh, for the industry. And we went pretty deep with Bology Srinivas on, on the why. It was a very meta conversation. If you haven't seen it yet, go ahead and check it out either on YouTube or in one of the Crowdcast replays. Um, today's going to be a little bit about the how. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to bring in um, three of the folks from uh, Masari's leadership team that span uh, research with uh, Marcha, who's the GM of our hub, uh, Duran, who's VP of engineering, and, uh, and Florent, who's our director of product. And we wanted to kind of balance between uh, sharing a little bit more about you know how we operate at Masari uh, without it turning into a shill session for all of our products. That's going to be woven throughout, so you know buyer beware. But uh, but I think it's important to give a little bit of uh, contextualization for how we think about the uh, informational market for crypto more broadly and how we just kind of navigate day to day. Um, I'm assuming that for the most part, the folks that are here are interested in not just having a regurgitation of all 165 pages that I wrote in the report, <laughs> but more importantly, how can you kind of use that as an index and, uh, and a level set uh, and then, you know, how do you actually think uh, and how do you tackle the information challenge uh, and, and, and information processing challenge that crypto presents in the new year so that you can keep pace um, month to month and not just wait for next year's annual report, uh, which, which hopefully this one will hold up pretty well. Um, but we'd encourage people to ask questions in the chat um, and, uh, and, and try to make this as interactive as possible. The, uh, the playback will also be available for, uh, for those that show up late. So um, we'll have this on YouTube as well. But I want to start off um, by uh, maybe just kind of outlining how we think about information within crypto more broadly and, and, and how we actually structure our thinking and, and tackle the day-to-day -day challenge. Um, and I'm, I'm going to uh, basically talk about uh, crypto the crypto asset information pyramid, I'd say, um, for the universe of assets. So not just talking about like, how do you get an institution on board with Bitcoin and making a zero to one decision or how to get them on board with ETH and making a zero to one decision, whether to buy or not, but actually thinking about um, the first hundred, first thousand assets that um, you might interface with either as an investor, a software developer that's integrating some of these or playing around with um, with new applications. And um, and understanding um, how to kind of connect all the pipes, both qualitative and quantitative. Um, and for that pyramid, there's basically you know, three parts of the pyramid. Uh, I'd say there's a 1A and 1B, which is just raw data and then curated and processed data. Um, that's quantitative and, and kind of qualitative. So it could be things like news on the qualitative side or, or market data on the quantitative side. Um, then you have uh, kind of the next level of the pyramid, which I, I would say is contextualized, right? So actually thinking about the snapshot curated data on either a longitudinal uh, or, or latitudinal approach. So uh, time series or comps, right? Um, and we talked a little bit about how we, we think about those twin challenges. And then um, maybe most importantly, there is the, um, the decision-making layer, right? So how do you take all of those insights and, and actually uh, make a decision within you know the confines of your day-to-day -day job, uh, either as an investor, someone that works at a, a big exchange, um, or uh, someone that's working in an enterprise trying to get in uh, to crypto for the first time, uh, or you know, a developer that's hacking away. Uh, how do you actually push you know trans take this information, translate it, and then kind of push it into some action item? Um, and uh, and and there's obviously a ton to unpack kind of across the board, but. Uh, I guess for starters, um, let's uh, let's use that pyramid, Duran, and, and we'll kind of start with you on the quantitative side. Um, what what is the scope of the challenge uh, with this you know ETL pipeline that we've built and, and that I think people need to build within crypto, and then let's kind of compare it to other legacy you know data aggregators or um, or other like analytics 
platforms that are very kind of vertical or asset class focused and, and, and you know, we'll, uh, we'll use that as the springboard. Yeah, so um, I'll do an analogy to the enterprise world of uh, traditional B2B. There are three aspects of it that are fairly similar in terms of um, how do we think about data ingestion um, and uh, processing of data. And there's one aspect that is unique to crypto. Uh, so in terms of both quantitative and qualitative, uh, the foundational layer is getting the data source. And getting the data source, it's all about getting the right tooling for the data source ingestion. On the qualitative side, which is something that we've explored very little in the previous years, and this year we just went he head in first, um, what we've been fairly surprised about is the maturity of tooling throughout the years. So just, just a comparison between this year and 2018, when we uh, last explored something deep in, in, in the space, the, the tooling has gotten a lot more mature on the qualitative side. And specifically what I mean is interacting with on-chain, it's easier to interact with nodes and you have much more stability and resiliency around node uptime, such that when you're acquiring for something, um, you can be sure that you're getting the data that, it, it, that, that, that you need, as opposed to building a lot of the infrastructure underneath in order to create the data. And specifically, we've been impressed with Alchemy as a partner. Um, they, they've done great jobs in creating that uh, abstraction layer to query data from uh, Ethereum primarily. Um, uh, and we can talk about the, 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 the other aspects as well. The second tooling that we've been impressed by on the qualitative side is Hardhat. Hardhat, very developer-friendly tool. Um, this is an aspect that we'll talk about in the fourth dimension as well in terms of the ETL pipelining. But Hardhat has made it a lot easier and a lot more stable in terms of interacting, but also simulating uh, on-chain interactions. So what I mean by it is we do a lot of stuff in pulling the data, but we also do a decent amount in terms of interacting with on-chain. A um, couple of things that continue to be fairly strong, Etherscan um, has been here throughout the, the history of Ethereum. It's continued to be a, a, a ground, uh, um, like foundational tool. The graph has been really helpful. Uh, so the graph has been helpful for us both on the quantitative and qualitative side of things. In terms of quantitative, we ingest DeFi metrics from the graph. And what they've done really well is contextualizing the, the data, is creating a domain model around DeFi metrics, around this, this space, such that when you go in, you can work from a higher level of abstraction rather than just the, the raw data. And something that is fairly uh, underrated, Tenderly. Uh, Tenderly is a tool that we use all the time. And it makes developers a lot easier to comprehend smart contracts and interact, but also read through the smart contract. In terms of uh, quantitative side, um, our partner Kaiko uh, continue to feed us a lot of market data. Metrics uh, has, has been killing it. Uh, we are looking ahead, going to invest more in terms of this DeFi metrics ingestion space, as well as thinking about how to do it cross chain as well in terms of depth. I think we have decent amount of breadth. Uh, the question is how to invest in, in, in breadth. Um, so, so let's let's yeah let's let's pause there because I want to pull in uh, Florent and um, and March and then we'll kind of come back to you for the other parts of the pyramid. Um, so you know, Duran just talked a lot about the um, the quantitative and, and on chain um, elements of of kind of ingestion and just the foundation that I think didn't exist a few years ago, which is how do you get basic information for for every single one of these assets, right? It, it used to take. Um, uh, quite some time to get an asset updated on Coin Market Cap, you know, or Coin Gecko. A, a lot of the tooling and middleware that exists now, and a lot of the new data points that exist are are available because there's been a specialization in data providers. Um, Florent, I'll go to you kind of first. In terms of um, the 
breadth of you know, information providers. Do, do you want to just kind of give a quick breakdown on the quantitative side of, of you know, kind of who we look at as best in class or, or kind of who the most popular or, or reliable are? Um, and, uh, and maybe we won't do the converse. I don't think we want to, we want to crap all over anybody, but um, I'd, I'd kind of keep it positive and, and just kind of help orient people towards the tools that we use as a sanity check um, and kind of using all the building blocks that Duran just mentioned. Yeah, I think, I think there are a lot. Uh, in terms of uh, accessibility of market data and timing of how fast new assets are listed, I think CoinGecko is probably the best today. I think that's why uh, a lot of people use CoGecko nowadays. An asset may launch, and it's going to be on on the small analytics side, uh, like DexGuru, pretty quickly. But then it gets into CoGecko very, very fast. So if you're looking for like new launch assets with price data, CoGecko probably has the best coverage there. Uh, that's really in terms of breadth of asset coverage. How many assets are listed on the Coin Ranking uh, kind of platform? In terms of this, what we've seen is there there has been a lot of niche players uh, that have emerged in these past few years, very specialized on some types of data. I, I think that the one uh, a lot of the DeFi users use is DeFi Lama. DeFi Lama, as, same as CoinGeckos, they have a huge breadth of asset coverage and protocol coverage. Uh, there are protocols that don't even have an asset that are already listed on DeFi Lama because they have uh, the value locked into the protocol. And so DeFi Lama has really nailed down focusing on one single data point, which was total value lock. Now they're extending to uh, NFT data as well and, and looking forward to where that goes. But I'd say DeFi Lama is pretty useful, uh, both to uh, look at the kind of the current protocols and all they're doing, but also for upcoming protocols. Uh, they even added an airdrop kind of Airdrop watch list where you can identify airdrops based on uh, protocols that have usage and no token yet. So that has been pretty interesting. Um, staying into DeFi data because there is a lot there. Uh, I think Token Terminal really, really nailed down the can the revenue kind of calculation for DeFi protocols. Uh, so I, I don't think there is any other provider that does that today that calculates revenue for all protocols, mainly on Ethereum, but also potentially across chain, I think in the future, where you can really get uh, a good idea of how many cash flows are coming back to token holders or liquidity providers on a single protocol. And uh, I think that has driven at one point, kind of like the DeFi valuation based on cash flow. Uh, we saw that Axie Infinity went up because the revenue were going up. I think nowadays it's, there is less clear of a relationship between price and protocol cash flow. But I think Token Terminal has been a great tool uh, there as well. Uh, on the NFT side, uh, I think Nansen has really nailed down the new mint kind of copy trading aspect of NFT during NFT server. I think it's a little bit less useful today because there are less exciting mints. But at that point, uh, you can literally go on Nansen, look at what the largest holders of NFT largest collectors were minting mint those assets and either keep them or sell them a couple of days after and make a profit that will pay back to Nansen's subscription. So I think Nansen has been really good at identifying kind of key addresses uh, and building all the tools to, to analyze like on the NFT side, but also on the DeFi side, what those addresses are doing. And it, it's been a pretty killer tool. There are like smaller tools like IC tools that are going to be faster in terms of uh, how fast does a new mint get listed. And I, I've used IC tools myself this summer when kind of like the minting period was crazy. So I, I, I guess the perfect tooling set is, is always kind of like a, a large tool that is well known like Nansen and then kind of finding niche tools. Uh, another one on the NFT space that I really like mm. is Context. It's, it's less well known, but you can basically see what CryptoPunk holders uh, or Loot holders, Blitmap holders, Todd's holders are minting and selling and buying in real time. For like kind of like a feed like you'll get on Twitter, uh, so it's pretty good UI and 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 you get some context and that's what they call like that on on, on how the market is is going, and then in terms of on-chain data, I mentioned like DeFi side with Token Terminal and DeFi Lama, uh, there is still uh, a good amount of players that have a good breadth of kind of like chain acti activity, uh, so uh, I think Coinmetrics is one, I think Ember Data is another one. 
uh, they, they, they both really focus on kind of like the granularity and the precision of that data. And so they all have things like the number of addresses that are active, mining data, staking data. So they really have uh, a good breadth of data and chains covered. And so it's pretty useful just to look at a chain at a global basis rather than like digging in into like specific kind of DeFi protocols. Uh, on the governance side, because that's uh, somewhere Messari has, has invested a lot too, I think the, the, the key tooling from the space has really been snapshots. Uh, snapshots has had tremendous usage from most of the DAOs and has been a key building block. I think a lot of DAOs are still running majorly on snapshot and Gnosis safe today and are not using any on-chain kind of uh, governance contracts. So uh, yeah, I'd say snapshot is, is, is a key one to highlight there. We're going to come back to Snapshot uh, as we get higher up the pyramid, but um, I, I think that starts to bleed into qualitative updates and, yeah. and, and ingestion. And uh, I think Marcia might be the very per best person in the world at curating the, the noise on a day-to-day -day basis that comes from the combination of Twitter and the, the crypto media and the kind of mainstream media and their coverage of, of crypto. Um, Marcia, talk a little bit about your personal curation process and then some of the other tools that are available um, for synthesizing and, and kind of getting through the um, uh, the complete day-to-day -day chaos of, of you know, crypto news. And I'll use that kind of maybe very broadly. And then um, maybe we can go from there and, and talk about just like reliability of sources and, and, and how you use your human filter uh, to at least cal calibrate like what is worth paying attention to, just given that everything has gone vertical in the last 18 months. And it's a, it's really probably impossible for just about anybody to keep up. Um, maybe uh, maybe you're one of the lone exceptions uh, on the on the qualitative side because because you've gotten this down to a science. So just spill all of your secrets for yeah. stay up day to day. Yeah. So and, and just to give some context to that, so I've been uh, yeah, I've been on the as a little side project I've been doing this newsletter for the last like three years or so and uh, it was actually funny because when i started doing it like in the summer of 2018 when i when i started working in crypto it was actually pretty easy just because there wasn't so much information out there like a written forum right like context in terms of news and and, and research and blogs and everything so it was a relatively easy thing to do um and that that has become more challenging especially this year um yeah and um and i think there's i i would maybe talk a little bit about the problems there right i think there's kind of like three problems uh when it when it comes down to you know written content in in crypto that synthesizes things number one there's the discoverability you know the the, the curation and the organization of that and you know it, it's gotten probably a little bit better but still, I think it comes down to a lot of individuals doing that, right? When it, especially when it comes down to getting information from different sources and not one in the same source. Two, uh, consistency and quality. Um, you know, some of the some of the firms that do this, you know, for a living, so to say, obviously have a lot more consistency than perhaps you know some of the. Some of the funds and uh, and some of the blogs and and you know even I guess stratify at this stage and finally there's a lack of standards right uh, around this this information if you think about research expectation of you know what a research report looks like in terms of like you know different type of research but financials you know what does that look like um, so maybe to start there I think uh, Ryan I think in terms of it's you know it's it's definitely more an art than a science. I mean, I do this on a day-to-day -day basis. I have milled it down so that it takes me about, you know, an hour, but it's it's literally between setting up like feeds, like through tools like Feedly, which is kind of like obviously not a, not a direct crypto tool, but uh, which in my mind is one of the best, like, you know, subscribing to a bunch of newsletters, both like more generic newsletters, like business publications, as well as crypto specific. Then there's a couple of other curators out there with like a, a different type of focus, like the Daily Ape is fantastic when it comes down to, um, you know, Twitter curation. Uh, Unfolded in Telegram is awesome for like, you know, the, the, the news as it comes out. And there's a bunch of these things. 
um, yeah, and it's uh, and then it's like putting it through a through a filter, right? And then it, 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 that's that's a human filter at the moment, obviously, and it comes down to you know experience and you know knowing who your audience is and and you know what is uh, what is important. Um, yeah, in terms of like what is out there um, and you know mentioning some of the ones you know where there where there is like more synthesis when it doesn't come down to uh specific uh sources i think it, it comes down to a lot of individuals and uh and certain type of newsletters am i still can you still hear me okay good sorry yep, you're still sure. good i i froze for a second and um yeah and i think that from a from a research perspective uh, is that what you wanted me to come on as well, like the, the landscape there? Yeah, please. Uh, yeah. Just in, you know, I think you, you captured the breadth, um, yeah. but, you know, you could spend all day long reading Twitter and reading, you know, the, the hundreds of different you know, stories or blogs that come out. How do you actually surface quality and have some redundancy in your coverage without just kind of going through the mind numbing, like news addict process of, of skimming a bunch of information, but not actually absorbing anything that's high signal. Yeah, um, I think, you know, it's, 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 it, you, you just, you know, unless you have, and then not, not to, to shill here, but like, you know, a platform like, like, you know, Masari or, um, or like, you know, some, you need a, a source that does that curation for you, basically, because it, there is just no way you will get through it or stay on top of it or get something that's, you know, a single source. So, yeah, I think I think that that is that is the main thing. And it's 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 hard. There's not that many that do that in crypto. Um, so that, that's probably a good jumping off point. And, and uh, Marcia, you and Florent can tag team this one um, to talk about the kind of the, the second layer of the pyramid, which is the contextualization layer. Right. So. We've talked about like how to set up your feeds, um, both, you know, what Duran mentioned in terms of like some of the nitty gritty, of the infrastructure. And then, you know, with, with Marcia, how do you actually get the, the human feed set up? Um, Florent kind of touched on a little bit of both um, when uh, talking about, you know, snapshot on the qualitative side and some of the other providers we look at for, for potential third party data ingestion. Um, who, uh, you know, we're obviously doing quite a bit of contextualization. Um, uh, because we have this combination of a, a research team and then a data product and, and kind of automated platform. But um, who, who do you think is, um, who else is, is doing good work here and, um, and really making it easier to take uh, something that's either like highly quantitative and then automating it and, and kind of scoring it. So it's got like some type of uh, you know, signal score or the reverse, um, who's doing a really good job of taking the uh, kind of raw data feeds and then marrying that with um, with insights and, and analytical research. The the newsletter that comes to mind for me, I think Coinmetrics does a good job with their weekly newsletter. Um, and then uh, our network from Spencer Noon is another one that I think has been, uh, been been really top notch. But um, who uh, who do we use to like, I guess, check our work right uh, in, in terms of like quality of, of maintaining that balance? I think su surprisingly, I'd say uh, Dune Analytics is not striving for contextualization, but is doing a great job uh, on that just based on their community of wizards and the one creating the dashboards. So there is not so much of a contextualization and qualitative, quantitative kind of mixing uh, going on into Dune Analytics, but because they have a strong community of dashboards creator, uh, they are able to elevate kind of like the key metrics and the key insights you can get on these different protocols. So I think it's it's a great platform because it, it moves fast. It moves as fast as the dashboards creator create dashboards, basically. So they are not so much in the same game as us, trying to like add context solely on quantitative feed. But I'd say they they're pretty good at adding context indirectly through for their community. And we use Dune. Marcia, you can talk maybe a little bit about the the quarterlies and and how do you take something in the legacy finance world that people take for granted, which is ongoing reporting. And how do you bring that quality to the decentralized world without losing any granularity or, or kind of consistency of coverage? 
<laughs> yeah, so that's that's something uh, that's something that we've been looking at this year, right? So obviously this year we've seen the rise of the DAO, uh, you know, to, to to name it that way, and I think you know what what is uh, what is what is so interesting within these um, what we what we've been seeing at least within these DAOs, these DAOs are reliant on their community members, right, for for human capital, and. Um, you know, we've, we've seen very diverse DAO communities arise that need financial reporting for decision making. But despite the fact that, you know, the data on the blockchain is public, it takes significant skill and resources, you know, to make that data useful, right? And, uh, and obviously tools like Dune Analytics help uh, by extracting that data, but still, you know, in order to do something that looks like a financial report you know you, you need to you need to be a, a guru basically and um so what we've uh, what we've been doing for for compound over their third quarter is we have created for them what is effectively equivalent to a, a quarterly report and um it's interesting right because th there is there is no standards here yet right and then um, so how we've been going about it is, you know, thinking about, okay, so what if, if Compound would have like a, you know, financial statements, what would they look like, right? What would be the key metrics that we want to look at that are important for this community to stay on, of, of diverse stakeholders to stay on top of? And, you know, how, how, would, we, how would we group it? And then in, in a way that makes sense and then contextualize it. And, um, and then, you know, obviously on the basis of that template that we created, uh, we then created a dashboard on Dune and at the end of the quarter pulled the data, um, you know, actually built those financial statements and then, you know, start charting out the individual metrics and, you know, dive into the, you know, how these numbers moved and why they moved uh, to some extent and then add some qualitative information to it. And uh, yeah, so that's what we did for Compound. Um, we uh, and, and and what we we subsequently hosted an earnings call for them as well. And I think what the value add there is, right? There, as I said, there is no standardization. First of all, so there's no IFRS or or US GAAP. There's no standards for for any of these sectors. And although we've seen like individual contributors uh, and 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 some of these themes like you know, doing their own dashboards and their own equivalent of financial statements. I think that standardization, first of all, is going to be important for comparability. Also, you need to see consistency, right? And if you have individual contributors that act independently, you know, there's always that risk that that consistency goes away very quickly, you know, when that person has achieved their objectives, whatever they are, right? Uh, also, I think quality is obviously important. So having a trusted brand behind that like like masari is is is, is very helpful and uh, and i think finally um to come to come back uh, you know th th there's obviously uh, it has been an explosion of DAOs, and there, there there's there's going to be a lot of demand for these type of services and having access to human resources uh that you know can help you know produce all that work is, is helpful as well and that's what we're trying to do uh with with our hub which is uh yeah which is basically a kind of like a layer two scaling solution uh for these DAOs and protocols so on uh on on layer one layer two um as we're kind of going into our our next part of the pyramid here um duran we talked about um kind of raw data the first kind of go around and 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 maybe slightly processed uh data in terms of the tooling that's available. So you're not required to go directly to the blockchains to sync, right? So like middleware like the graph or alchemy, et cetera, I think you know, helps with that abstraction. Um, but as we move up uh, in complexity and, and, and tr start to get into like the um, labeling and domain modeling and, and making sure that you're actually um, defining what these inputs to your systems are, um, and tagging them correctly so that they look clean and they'll actually spit out things like aggregated metrics or um, or you know, metrics that are appropriate by sector. You know, Florent talked about uh, Nansen's wallet tracking system and, and how they're able to kind of parse between you know whale holdings or, or NFTs versus you know, DeFi metrics. Um, 
So much of this uh, kind of goes back to the Lego thesis um, and how easy it is to kind of build on other building blocks instead of just building everything from kind of square one. Can you talk about the, the challenge in getting to the same depth of coverage that we have for, say, Compound, which is the quarterly report that, that we just you know, outlined, and some of the other quarterlies that we're doing kind of leverage the EVM and Ethereum, you know, your ERC-20 tokens in particular, because of all the other tooling that's available between Dune, Coinmetrics, the graph, you know, so on and so forth. Um, what, what does the uh, challenge look like as more activity starts to move either to L2s or to other layer ones? And um, where are we going to see infrastructure develop so that like this subset of ERC-20 assets will have the same you know, uh, coverage as, as maybe something that's on another emerging blockchain. Um, and, uh, and, you know, you can build the full picture however you want, but, but there, there's maybe three or four different touch points there. If you're, uh, if you're just mapping out the uh, data ingestion challenge and how we kind of fit it into our standards for what we've already done on the EVM side. Yeah. So in order to answer that question, I think it's helpful to get a picture of what that pipeline looks like and just taking a step back from the high, high level. Um, three things that are needed in terms of basically any ETL pipeline. One is the tooling, the, the data, data. Two is the cleansing and normalization of data. Three is the contextualization of data. And, and that's the last part is sort of what uh, Marcia and Flohan talked about in terms of making it or breaking it for the end user. Um, but we also add a fourth element into this, which is the participation of once you are aware of all of this information, how do you parachute back in into one specific area and participate into this space? Now, in terms of the um, comparison point, I think there's one touch point that we've realized that I think the community is realizing as well is developer stickiness is a very strong metric where, um, and, and we, we've sort of seen this today with uh, AWS going down with a wide outage. It's impacted us, it's impacted our, the services that we use, it's impacted the, the downstream consumers, it's impacted Netflix. So developer stickiness is a huge point here where if you build a strong community of developers that are using the, the tooling, then it's very hard to escape outside of it. And we're sort of seeing the onset of that with the EVM tooling um, around Ethereum, but also the layer twos on Ethereum that are EVM compatible also benefit from that aspect. Uh, two other systems that we're keeping in touch with one is Solana. Solana has invested a lot in terms of developer documentation, tutorials, and getting onboarded, and Cosmos. Cosmos has done the same thing. Both of them are coming at it from different angles, but are basically taking a similar stance in regards to Ethereum. Ethereum, the idea is just getting it into the hands of developers as easily as possible. And the tooling has matured over time, such that getting into the door is very easy. Solana and Cosmos have come at an angle of, hey, we're going to use a robust programming language, Rust or Go, and you can build upon that robustness on, on top of it. So the, the landscape is, is still very much yet to be determined as to wh who wins the, the, the line share. Right now, it's very much Ethereum. But we are monitoring going forward in terms of where the developers are going, how the tooling evolves, and that leads into the, the cleansing of the data as well. Of once we have a lot of this raw data, it's, it's about finding that normalization layer that um, permeates across the, the various ingestion points. So how, we're ingesting data for forum, uh, forum data, we're ingesting data from snapshot, we're ingesting data from various smart contracts. How do we normalize e each of those points such that we are making sure that um, we're covering 
couple of different areas. One is getting the data into our system in a usable way and an efficient way. And for that, we need to change the data structure a bit. But we also account for human error. Everyone is, is, is human, human error permeates. And that's also a common point with enterprise software as well, is in order to do proper contextualization, you need to work with highly uh, clean data. And it, it all comes down to how, how, do you, how do you normalize it? So an example of this is uh, on co compound, um, a human error occurred where someone doubly encoded their proposal, which means that generally you have a proposal, you, you push it out as text, someone doubly encoded it, which subsequently broke uh, a lot of the pipelines, including the subgraph that is associated with it. So it's, it's about how do you deal with those human errors that can and will occur in order to normalize the data. And the last point is contextualization. So once you have the data, we really believe in a computer human symbiotic relationship where the computer can do maybe 80% of, of the work, maybe a little bit more uh, depending on how, how we stretch it, but there'll always be a, a last mile where we need a human to properly contextualize of what is going on across the space. And that's what uh, Marsha was mentioning with the, the, the compound report. Someone has to come in and make sense of the, the last mile. We can maybe automate a lot of this, but in order to tie a full string across the, the, the entire space, that's, that's the bread and butter. And it's also one of the hardest problems is merging the dispersed data sets into a, a common world. One of the things that I don't think a lot of people appreciate, you know, um, if you have an audience, you're getting yelled at left and right, right, as, as, as a data aggregator, because like, why don't you have this? Or, you know, we've been asking for, for you know, X and Y for six months, but, you know, instead you prioritize Z. I think um, a lot of people don't uh, maybe appreciate the challenge as a kind of broad based, you know, ingestion and, and kind of research platform. How um, how you have to prioritize uh, different data sets based on uh, your upstream vendors and their reliability. So um, when we think about adding new data sets or we think about adding um, you know additional uh, entire ecosystems, how how do you uh, Florent think about whether something has critical mass and 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 just talk a little bit about how we balance like the support tickets. Um, and and put things like maybe like we'll peel back the curtain a little bit and and like when something is just going to be permanently stuck in the icebox versus when it has enough like fire around it and there's a, enough customer demand and there's the balance of like okay there's actually a tool that we believe is somewhat reliable at this point that we would you know kind of feel comfortable you know actually adding that part of the, the pipe um, it's a little bit more art than science but I think it would go a long way towards demystifying. Uh, and FUD busting some of the, you know, Masari is just in the tank for Ethereum and, you know, doesn't give a shit about anything else. It's like, well, no, uh, it just so happens that there has not historically been a whole lot of non EVM activity until this year. And who are some of the other middleware solutions that, that we might be able to work with so that things don't break on day one um, when we actually try to integrate this? Yeah. <clears throat> As a data aggregator, as you said, it's 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 tricky because our goal is to aggregate everything. Uh, so, like in an ideal world, we will just have all all the data that exists in crypto across chains, across layer one, layer twos, across protocols. Uh, we can do that because we have to prioritize. But as you said, we also have to uh, play with what's available. So there there is a few different kind of steps in the process um, where it's not just. I, there's the data challenge of like, where can we find this data? Where can we aggregate it from? And then there is how it fits into our product. Uh, one example, uh, we've been pretty slow and we haven't done any kind of NFT data ingestion uh, because first there was a lot of factors already there that were building a lot of NFT tooling. And we didn't seem like given everything we we're doing already and everything we had in progress, we will have enough time to build like a competitive product. So there's this kind of aspect of, uh, are we going to be competitive or are we just aggregating for the sake of aggregating? There's the aspect of how does it fit into our product? In the case of NFTs, uh, NFTs are different assets than fungible assets. 
So you have a contract address like you have on fungible assets, but then you also have a token ID. So you need a different way to kind of index this data into our system and then distribute it. And then you need a different way to expose it on the front end. So it's not as easy as plugging into the OpenSea API and getting all of this data because our goal is always kind of shipping uh, a contextualized product. And I think we say the word contextualized a lot, but we really want to make sure we don't just ingest data for the sake of, uh, of ingesting it. I do think we'll tackle NFT uh, because as I said, our, our goal is to have an aggregated view of the landscape. But in general, we don't really want to be the first unless we have a competitive advantage. And I think the same is true uh, for like non-Ethereum based uh, data. Uh, we've, we focus on Ethereum because that that's where the tooling was the best. So we subgraphs were available for Ethereum protocols. Uh, it's, it's pretty easy to go and, and pull on-chain data. Uh, we actually currently working uh, or looking at different data providers, uh, like the graph, which has subgraph across chains now, or Amber data that has index of a lot of data across chains as well, to go from just Ethereum to all the EVM compatible chain. But from there, getting to something like Solana is even more tricky because the infrastructure in general uh, is not really there. There is not big data providers that can give us this data clean and in a robust way. The, the worst thing that can happen is we ingest data and then it breaks. And then we did something for a couple of months in order to get this data, as I said, into our schema, into our front end. And then the third data provide, third party data provider that was uh, providing this data is no longer working. So we always patient, and I, as you said, the, it's a right mix of art and science, but uh, the end goal is, is building something that is sustainable, that is not gonna break uh, every day, as well as kind of looking at where we can be competitive. Uh, so like on the governance space, for example, we felt like we could be competitive, and so we invested in this space. Uh, we for engineering team, we for research team. So, yeah, hopefully, uh, as we can add resources, uh, add engineers, add product uh, managers, add researchers, we can tackle more of it. But again, it's always kind of, where can we be competitive? Uh, is the space mature enough? Are the data providers mature enough? And how does it fit into our current product? Realize I was on mute. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, participation, uh, I think, in, in, in just a minute. But um, I think the last thing that I'll, I'll say here, and I'll, I'll comment on this, and then I'll switch it over to you, Marcia. One thing to keep in mind in terms of like our positioning, and, and I, I think the framing of like CoinGecko and CoinMarketCap as like these mass retail platforms is, is good. You have some other um, services that are, are really going like heavy on one or two core blockchains, right? Like a Etherscan is, is on Ethereum, obviously. Um, you know, Glassnode is doing a lot on, on Bitcoin and Ethereum, but not really going you know, too broad. They're all tackling different segments of the market. Um, and I'd say the ones that are going like extremely narrow in terms of their focus are uh, power like institutional level data providers. Whereas the ones that are going the broadest um, and not necessarily the deepest are, are kind of the mass retail uh, platforms. We kind of sit somewhere in between because we've always had this target of like crypto professionals and like basically the insurgents at the enterprises, right? So like the first incremental user at, at JP Morgan versus JP Morgan as an institution. Um, the teams at the crypto funds and the crypto exchanges and wallets and, and, and so forth. And so, um, you know, our target historically has been like how deep can we be on assets that are, for instance, like 100 million in market cap or more. And then we'll kind of use that as the bogey for when something like hits a critical mass where we really you know, need or, or, or should support it. But um, that also means that things are, are kind of going to move in parallel where we're going to get deeper and deeper progressively on the top 50 assets as we add headcount on the research side. But we're also going to get broader in terms of the assets that need to be supported um, and we actually have, you know, an upgrade coming soon that, that is going to expand markets data coverage for, for you know, thousands of additional assets. But um, it will at least be discoverable on our platform, right? So that it's easier to kind of backfill this long tail as it gets fatter and, and as the number of assets that hit a certain threshold get, get higher. Um, but Marcia, that's really where the research team comes in, right? We've, we've talked about like the, the hub analysts is like our layer two scaling. But even like the internal analyst team that we have that's now 30 plus, uh, it was five at the beginning of the year. So we're, we're, we're 6X already, and even they can't keep up uh, just with the, the demand that I think we've seen across the board for analyst services. Um, 
how do we um, think about leveraging them um, as you know both the contextualization layer and just like the mechanical Turks that can do a lot of these things that don't scale um, and and you know kind of get things eighty percent of the way where they need to be so that you know the the end users are able to navigate the, the market a little bit more effectively even if one hundred percent of this information isn't available on Masari in like a nice neat like command line interface uh, like you'd see on a Bloomberg terminal. You're on mute. Yeah, I think there's there's like two sides to it, right? As you already mentioned, there's like uh, the hub or hub analyst, and I will explain. Uh, I will explain in a, in, a, in a minute for who doesn't know what that is, what, what, what we're trying to do there. And then there's our in, our internal analyst team. I think um, you know we did our we did our internal research team. You know, there's obviously a team of analysts that's that's writing research that you see through our pro if you have a pro subscription or enterprise subscription uh, every day, and that is competing with certain other providers in the market. And then we have this whole army of researchers behind the screen to what to what Duran was saying that kind of like does that last mile, right? And I think a lot of that last mile stuff comes down to, you know, stuff that is really time sensitive, uh, like our, our 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 Intel product, for example, you know, which is which is focused on events and you know where we need to be on the spot at if and when they happen and and you know where we want to get things right. And then you know there's some some of the uh, some of the other things that we're doing, um, uh, some of them where, you know, where, uh, where it goes to a level of, of depth and granular granularity where it's really quite hard to do quality control um, if you leverage people that, you know, don't work for you and that don't do these, this every day, all day long. Um, I think on the hub side, so hub, we, we, as we're sorry, we've always worked for those uh, not familiar. We've always worked uh, with with community analysts uh, since uh, since since the very early days. Uh, what was then called the registry, and which was basically you know doing what is the asset profiles today, like a kind of like a, a single source of truth for project data, you know that you can that you can go to, and um, you know. As a, as a firm, we started contextualizing that through our research and over the past couple of years have built like a uh, trusted brand there for ourselves. But what we saw last year uh, during the DeFi summer, you know, there was just an explosion of innovations uh, just the, by means of the breadth of it, but also the speed of innovation cycles that just became so fast uh, that we realized you kind of like need an army of analysts, you know, to uh, to, to, to contextualize everything that's what's going on. And um, maybe to, to draw a, a brief parallel there, it, it, that's very valuable to especially projects that are you know still still up and coming to, to get like research coverage, right? Because um, you know if you if if no one has time, all these investors, you know, and even like research firms to 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 do all these research is for, for all these separate protocols. It's just the resources are just not there. But for the protocols at the same time, it's super valuable because you know once you get coverage, uh, people know about you. They may uh, participate one way or the other on that basis. Uh, there it could be positive impacts there, obviously in terms of adoption, potentially on on your token, and it all goes from there. And that's exactly the thing that you see in equity research. Um, which is obviously more singular focused on investors, and, and we cover a much you know broader for a much broader audience. But uh, so that's a, that's what we're trying to do with the hub, both with uh, research that we provide to the hub, uh, as well as uh, through the quarterly reports, and packets together. You can uh, you can almost uh, think of that as an outsourced IR function for these projects. Um, where uh, where we basically effectively bring three parties together, right? In the with, with with our platform, on the one hand, uh, it's uh, it's crypto projects, DAOs that want to get on people's radars, keep their stakeholders informed to facilitate decision making. Then there is aspiring contributors, uh, people that want to work in crypto, people that build a portfolio career in crypto, that want to share and showcase their work to a large captive audience. 
And there is all these stakeholders out there in the crypto economy that need a place where they can discover this relevant information about these projects uh, quickly. And so our value add there as Masari is, you know, one, the distribution platform that we have, two, the quality control that we do internally, uh, where, you know, we edit for objectivity and accuracy. And, you know, that's underpinned by our, our, our research brand. And, and we offer project discovery offers as well because of our, our you know, unique position in the, in the ecosystem and the network that, that we've built. Um, yeah, so, and I think the quality control is, you know, is, is obviously everywhere in crypto. Uh, it, it's, it's very tricky. And uh, so that I think you can only do that for certain types of research and contextualization and not for others. And um, yeah, let me just leave it like that. Well, uh, I think the, the contextualization layer is, um, you know, it, it's kind of table stakes for building a decision support tool, right? Um, and, uh, and and so going back to um, to what, you know, Florent had commented about, um, about Nansen, right? They, they're able to kind of track wallets and give you a little bit of context on the um, on the quantitative side as to like who some of the big NFT investors are and what their activity looks like on chain. I think that's invaluable. Um, but I would draw a pretty stark contrast between us and, and Nansen when it comes to the types of decisions that we're ultimately enabling for, for uh, our end users. Um, and the example that I tend to use it internally at least and, and sometimes in, in external interviews is um, targeting the um, missionaries versus the mercenaries or you know, said another way are you going to be power powering uh speculation and market making and trading and i'm not saying that in a disparaging manner right it's just two different personas right the, the mercenaries would be the the traders the speculators the folks that are making markets and um and and i think that's valuable at the stage of the game that we're in then there's also like the participation element um, for long-term missionaries or builders which is which information products do you need as part of your day-to-day -day workflows and you know building for the long term so whether that's engaging in you know governance tracking all of the off-chain events that are happening with a given protocol because you need to support it for you know your end users or, or to kind of support an existing in integration and, and uh, set of tools that you've developed um, for a, a given project so an example would be you know if you're a coinbase whether you're on the listing team or whether you're on the product or security engineering team you need to know about hard forks or changes in, in token economics or, or you know, upcoming contentious votes, et cetera. Um, I think um, when we talk about participation, for, for us where the rubber meets the road for the long-term uh, builders and, and like the missionaries that are gonna be using information tools, where we kind of came out as a team was um, that DAO govern governance and, and protocol governance uh, in general was going to be the critical missing building block for um, for active crypto participation. Um, and I want to hear uh, what Duran has to say uh, um, on this front, having kind of gone in the weeds and, and kind of pulled from some of the you know, Governor Alpha and Bravo contracts and integrated with Snapshot as part of this you know, Governor release that we just had. But first, um, why don't you give us the framing and, and let's double click on uh, what you were saying earlier about Snapshot and, and just kind of building like foundational decision-making infrastructure because... Um, to me, uh, that is the one area that we're mo more, most focused on in terms of like participation tooling and how we kind of leverage all of this other information and, and contextualization that, that we've built in the rest of our market intelligence platform. Um, how, um, how do we think about the landscape for, for actually making decisions, participating in Web3 um, full time or as a contributor, not just an investor? And, um, and, and where do we even start this kind of blank slate as we're, we're thinking about, you know, a, a, an operating system for DAOs and their communities. <clears throat> yeah, in, in general, it's, it's still on its early stage. And uh, something you realize when you start uh, diving into different DAOs is they all have very different ways of, of doing things. Uh, so uh, on my side, like personally, uh, the, the place I look first uh, is going to be the firm discussion or the builder groups in, in these calls because that's usually where the meat is of what is these DAOs uh, doing 
uh, what are they building, what are they deciding. But uh, really, the landscape is, 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 is very wide currently. Uh, so I think I mentioned Snapshot being the most used tool today for a lot of different DAOs. Uh, and outside of Snapshot and maybe Discourse, which is kind of like the forum discussion uh, operating system that most DAOs use today, uh, there is really a wide variety of, of tooling that is being used. I, I guess the third one that is common to most DAOs is going to be Gnosis Safe. Uh, so what we've seen is there is the light DAOs, non-binding DAOs, where uh, decisions are taken on snapshot through uh, off-chain votes, and then they get executed by the core contributors, uh, which are the multi-sig signers of uh, the Gnosis safe. So in this area, you, you still have a lot of trust. Like They are called DAOs, but uh, they are decentralized, yes, uh, but they are also not really autonomous at all time because you kind of need that uh, layer of trust that the multi-sig will actually uh, follow the decision the community has taken. So that's, I think, the most common form of DAOs that, that we have today. Uh, the second more like protocol DAOs are using on-chain governance. And some of them use Snapshot as a signaling tool, and then they have all, their own on-chain governance contract. But in this kind of landscape, it's, it's kind of like the Wild West. There is a lot of different contracts and frameworks that exist. Uh, there is Alpha and Bravo uh, that have been created by Compound that, that Duran is going to talk about. Open Zeppelin as a new framework that kind of looks like Bravo but with a few tweaks uh, and more gas efficient that just came out that now is being used by a lot of DAOs. Uh, Curve is using its own framework. Aave is using its own framework that DYDX is also using. It's just uh, Maker is using its own framework, and that's just on Ethereum. So, so really, the landscape is 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 wild today, and it's normal because there is a lot of innovation going on. So that's kind of our, our why we build our governance product, governance aggregator, in order to make sure that we can make sense of what's happening across forums, across off-chain votes, across on-chain votes. But uh, I'm probably going to pass the mic to Diran to dig into uh, Camp on Alpha and Bravo, and then we can get back to it. Yeah, something that we realize is um, with the advent of DAOs, it's really how do we organize people in a decentralized way? And that is one novel to, uh, it's also very messy. It's, uh, I think human interactions by nature is, is very messy. And that translates into how DAOs function. Uh, so Flaha mentioned that people congregate in those forums, in those Discord discussions, and there's a lot of threads going on. It gets a little bit cleaner once it gets into a forum where it's on a snapshot proposal, where it's fairly cheap to participate. It's, you just sign a transaction and it's free using your wallet. And then the third aspect is that it's the on-chain world. The on-chain world, people have created different types of smart contracts and are all, all sort of pushing the, the boundaries of what we can do in terms of agreeing on something while not being together, for one. But two, once we agree on it, we don't need a third party to operate it. And that is really the innovation uh, here with, with DAOs is once you trim down the funnel to the on-chain uh, proposals and on-chain participation, when people vote on something uh, and the vote passes through, then the agreement that was reached, either let's say in Compound, we're re raising the collateral uh, by 10%. If that is reached by the consensus, then that is what is going to happen on chain. Uh, whereas previously in the history of uh, human societies and organizations, you need a th a third party to ensure that th what you agreed on, either that's a legal entity or that's a military entity, what you agreed on gets executed. There, there, there needs to be some structure. So when we dove into the, the world of on-chain participation, that is the area that we wanted to enable the most. And in order to do that, uh, one, we needed to make sure that to take care of all the idiosyncrasies that happen in this world. Because as I mentioned before, everyone is pushing the boundaries a little bit 
and everyone is trying to like create their own little experiments, whether in Governor Alpha, whether in Governor Bravo, uh, Open Zeppelin Governor, Maker Ave, everyone is trying to create their own little experiments. But even within the, those little worlds, there are many experiments that are being run. So we get into minor consistency errors uh, between the, the tiny forks of Governor Bravo, the tiny forks of Governor Alpha. So the trickiness is how do you normalize that data together, make sense of this world and push it in a coherent way for our end user such that the ultimate goal is the end user doesn't need to know about all of the noise and all of the messiness that is happening. To an end user, I just want to make sense of what is happening in, in this world. I just want to see what's happening in Compound. I want to see what's what, what's happening in, in each of the proposals. And our goal is to string them together such that if you do need to participate, we give you the context on it and we allow you to connect your wallet and and make the decision that is needed. For us, it really came down to how do we test all of the use cases? And that, that was the a lot of the the pain and the the hardship in terms of making the system stable and consistent throughout the, the various interactions. And for that, uh, going back to the tooling, hard hat helped us a lot in terms of, hey, I wanna take a fork of the blockchain at this point in time, and I'm going to interact as if I'm one of the participants in this proposal. I can impersonate A16Z at this previous point in time, such that I can test exactly what would happen if I interacted through this platform that we created and see the, the, the ultimate result. And that is really the benchmark that we're looking for in the future integrations that we're doing as well. In terms of governance, in terms of cross chains, in terms of DeFi metric, is how do we keep that data integrity high, and make sure that to our end user the experience is seamless. But on the back end, we've tested all of the possibilities. Well, I want to um, I want to go round robin here, just with uh, maybe a, a parting word of wisdom for people that are are accelerating up the learning curve uh, in, uh, in crypto and, and trying to navigate. Um, I guess um, we'll, we'll kind of go uh, persona by persona. So, um, so Marcha for, uh, for, for a research analyst, Duran for a, a developer, um, and, uh, and then you know, Florent uh, for, for someone that's in the trenches trying to play like air traffic control, right? Uh, like some of our protocol specialists do out of our, our customer set, and, and, and maybe I'd put you in that bucket as well, among others. Um, how would um, how would you kind of orient uh, someone just starting in day one and, and, and helping them roll up their sleeves um, so that by the end of the year they're um, they're navigating like a pro? March, I'll start with you. Yeah, I think I think first of all, right, it depends on how how involved you're gonna you, you know you want to be. There's, you can obviously you know sign up to the Masari newsletter and a few others, and you know and and read some research. But I think in general, like one, follow your interest. You know, like uh, you know, whenever you pick up on a project that you're that does something that you're interested in, go after that. You know, get get your hands dirty as a user. You know, go down that rabbit hole. You know, then potentially join a community or you know get into the discords, um, and um, yeah, I think uh, the second perhaps like go after you know what 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 your skills are right and what your end goal is in the industry. So there there's other ways to get involved, right? If if you're like a if you're if you know if you know SQL well and you're into data, you know you can build data dashboards for projects and and learn your way through this way. Writing is obviously a big thing. You know, you can uh, share your views on Twitter. Uh, you can do simple stuff as summarizing a podcast. And then, you know, the the, the research thing, you can write research. And, uh, and you know, that's one of the things that we allow people to do through Hub, uh, which is definitely a career launch path for people in, into crypto, but, you know, but also, yeah, for people, uh, uh, a structured way to go deep. Duran, zero to one devs. Where where are you starting? Yeah, and uh, and just building or or learning. Yeah, th this is an uh, 
an old quote that's been circulated by many uh, OGs. Um, the easiest way to learn how to build is to build. Um, the, and it might sound redundant, but um, it's one thing to learn the specific incantations of how to interact with, with on-chain, but without a purpose of why you're doing this, it, it, a lot of people get hung up on just, all right, I tried something, it's hard, and I'll just stop. But hey, if you have a purpose of, I'm doing this in order to solve a problem, I'm doing this to build something fun, like an NFT, and I'll mint it to, to my friends, then it'll help you push through the, the boundaries because it's, it's not going to be easy, but the toolings are getting much, much better. So what I would recommend is find something that you're passionate about, build something around that problem set, use the tooling that, that are around. So I mentioned before, our community is really great. Hard hat uh, makes it super easy. Um, use a graph. So the graph is very easy to ex explore around the data. And, and of course, Etherscan has been uh, around for quite some time. And it's probably the easiest way to interact with Ethereum, but also Ethereum EVM-like uh, L2's uh, system like Poly Polygon Scan is basically a fork of Ethereum. It works great. And, it, and you basically get the same be behavior while having less uh, gas costs. So. That's, that's what I would say. Thorat, we'll give you the last word. Um, you're, a, uh, you're a a product manager at an institution or, or some big enterprise that's now trying to figure out crypto and, and all the potential integrations. They give you um, a budget and the ability to subscribe maybe to like five services. Obviously, Masari Enterprise is going to be one of them. Everybody knows that because they're on this call. Um, what, are, what are the other three or four? Probably a budget for gas, just to try out a lot of products. I think as, mm -hmm. uh, as a product manager and even anyone on the research side on engineering side, uh, trying products that exist on Ethereum or other chains, trying bridges, trying uh, DEXs, trying yield aggregators, trying everything that exists is always going to add value because for me, I really realize our protocol works when I actually use it. And then I go on the block explorer and I look at the transaction I just did and what it did on chain. So uh, a big budget for, for gas, if you want to discover Ethereum first, a smaller budget potentially for, for other chains, but that will also be rewarded. So it, it can be an investment as well with your drops. So try as much as you can in terms of the other kind of service provider outside of Nessari. And I think on Nessari, uh, double down on the Nessari Intel product and Nessari Governor product is probably going to add a lot of value to your work because that's where we cover everything that happens on these chains. And you can see the real activity in terms of like decision that are taken, code that is pushed, et cetera, et cetera. Outside of those, um, I'd say uh, Delphi, uh, in terms of like research and, and trends and where the market is moving, is probably uh, a good subscription that I will do as well. Just because as a product manager, uh, you need to know where the market is today, but also where the market is going to be tomorrow. So you'll have a lot of articles from Asari, but it's also good to have another source of, of information. And I'd say that Delta is probably going to be uh, the best one uh, there. Uh, in terms of other tooling, uh, I'd say it's, it's, hard, it's, hard to, it's hard to say. Uh, it really depends what you want to do, kind of like what's, you, what's your position in, in the company. Uh, I, I'd say having kind of like an on-chain data provider it's probably a good good call. Uh, so there is CoinMetrics, there is Ember Data. Uh, there are a lot of different niche data providers. Depending on your use case and and what kind of application you want to have on your product, I think subscribing to a few of those is probably a good option just to actually play with the data that is available. Uh, but really, the, the the first thing I think the first advice is using as many tools as you can, and as you use them, and as you start kind of reading about crypto or using crypto products try to put things into buckets. I think that helps a lot. Rather than just like trying a tool and then trying another one, try to say, well, this tool is a DEX and it differentiates from that other DEX because of X, Y, Z. At that point, you can have kind of like a better picture of uh, the landscape of crypto and there is something new. You can easily add it into one of your buckets in your mind or create a new bucket from it. 
so yeah, those will be my advice, I think, in general, for a product manager or anyone really, a researcher or even an engineer that want to get it and dirty trying out products. Awesome. Well, um, we're past the hour mark, and uh, and I think we could go for another two hours uh, whiteboarding different solutions and and you know how to go from zero to one, or uh, zero to one hundred more likely. Um, in terms of uh, questions, I think Marcia had hopped in and, and answered uh, a bunch of the questions that we had in the comments. Um, there was one from Kat uh, about our overarching goals for the company in 2022. Uh, hopefully, uh, this session kind of teased that. It's uh, to continue to grow and scale uh, our data feeds and uh, and some of the uh, tooling and, and decision support um, products that we have uh, across the board. Uh, we're going to be doing much more in terms of integrating with new blockchains, ingesting new metrics, and continuing to kind of leverage the building blocks that exist elsewhere, um, both quantitative uh, and qualitative information side. So if you are interested in helping us build, uh, then you should definitely drop an application. Um, we are going to be growing the product and engineering and research teams very aggressively all throughout 2022. So if you have ideas and you can build on top of uh, our stack, then um, we encourage you to apply or tell your friends. We are offering $10,000 per developer referral. We are offering $0 per research analyst referral, but that's only because there's so many great analysts and we have people that are able to train uh, the scrappiest among them, um, which, uh, which of course includes Marcia and, uh, and Eric, <laughs> uh, her counterpart on the research side. With, uh, with that, we're going to wrap up for today. Appreciate everybody tuning in. Um, it's been a, a good uh, one, two, three combo doing the, uh, the what, why, and how uh, to really come up the learning curve in 2022. Appreciate uh, your interest and everybody that's used Masari this year. It's been a monster year for us, for our team, for crypto in general. And until 2022, I am mercifully signing off in terms of uh, Masari Crowdcast and, uh, and other public speaking responsibilities. Thank you all. Happy holidays. And uh, thank you again to uh, Marcia, Florent, and Duran. But a great session. We'll see you guys on Slack. See everybody else on crypto Twitter. Ciao.